I'm Deborah Davidson, director and founder of Catalyst Conversations, and I'm so happy to welcome you to a Catalyst Conversation, the first of our fall season. This evening is part of Hub Week, you probably know, and we are pleased to be hosted and partnering with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. It has been a pleasure working with my colleague Shannon Humphreys for our third Hub Week collaboration. I'd like to also thank the Cambridge Arts Council, our founding partner and fiscal agent, our advisory board, and our volunteers who help us out. Thanks to those of you who have donated and helped us keep going over the past five years. We're very happy, uh, as I said, to be part of Hub Week, Greater Boston's Festival for the Future. Hub Week celebrates innovation and creativity at the intersections of art, science, and technology. Um, and we believe that future is being built here in Greater Boston. Um, in addition to events like uh, Two Lenses Communicating Science that are happening all around the city this year, Hub Week is also transforming Boston City Hall Plaza into a centralized uh, festival site with 80 shipping containers uh, and six geodesic domes. And it will be open uh, Thursday through Sunday this week, and there's events all over the city as well. Catalyst Conversations was founded in late 2012 to open a critical path for dialogue between the arts and sciences. We present intimate and provocative conversations between artists and scientists. And we're interested in connecting the two through programs, educational outreach, and public events like this, which demonstrate the conversation and synergy between art, science, and technology. Tonight, we will hear from artist Maria Peniel, microbiologist Mehmet Beck Berkman of Bacterial Art, and photographer Felice Frankel. The conversation will focus on communicating ideas in science, visually and otherwise. Science photographer Felice Frankel is a research scientist in the Center for Material Science and Engineering at MIT. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a Guggenheim Fellow, and was a senior research fellow in Harvard's uh, Faculty of Arts and Sciences and a visiting scholar at Harvard Medical School uh, Department of Systems Biology. She most recently developed and instructed the first online MOOC addressing science and engineering photography. Mehmet Berkman is a Turkish-born scientist with an international background and a deep passion for both the microbial sciences and visual arts. Dr. Berkman received his undergraduate education and master's degree in the UK at Imperial College and Reading uh, University, respectively. He received his PhD from the University of Vienna, completing much of the research on protein secretion at University um, Texas uh, at Houston. He conducted his postdoctoral studies on disulfide bond formation at Harvard Medical School, and he joined New England Biolabs where he leads his own research group um, developing um, novel bacterial strains for protein expression. Maria Peniel Cobo is a mixed media artist born in Spain. She studied fine arts in Madrid and has exhibited her world, excuse me, her work at the Cultural Center Isabel de Farmesio and the Sibony Gallery and Cultural Center Galileo. Encompassing sculpture, engraving, and photography, her work is an investigation of metamorphosis, evolution, and the idea of latency and immediate change. Her collaboration with Dr. Berkman on their bioart project uses scientific processes creating art from living organisms, which we will see in a moment. And we have an additional um, aspect of tonight's um, uh, event, which is inviting you, the audience, to participate in the conversation as it is happening. So I'll explain. We are delighted to have artist Pierre Gustafson, who is out in the lobby this evening. And in tandem with the conversation, you are welcome to live tweet during the conversation using the hashtag two lenses. So you can go ahead and tweet a few words or short phrases inspired by the speakers. The artists will not be seeing the talk directly, but will be responding to the feed of tweets uh, in the lobby. Um, and he'll do so by sketching in real time and create short drawing movies from his sketches as a way of illustrating the ideas. The resulting short movies will be on a loop that we will um, be able to enjoy during the reception. So Hub Weekers may also want to include hashtag Hub Week or hashtag Hub Week 2017. But to, insi to inspire Pierre, be sure to use two lenses spelled out all one word, not the number two. So with that, we'll begin. Um, Mehmet and Maria will go first. 
and uh, introduce you to their work, be followed by Felice, and then the four of us will um, have a conversation in the chairs, and you will be invited to join in after that. So without further ado. OK. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Deborah and Catalyst Conversions for giving us this opportunity to present our work today, and to Shannon and Broad for hosting this great event. And today, briefly, I'm going to talk to you about a collaboration that has begun with me and Maria for about seven years now. And we've been doing this fantastic bacterial art together. All the work I'm going to show you is made by Maria. And she volunteers her time and comes to my lab to do this fantastic work. And uh, I wanted to begin the conversation today by talking about bacteria. Um, most of us, when we hear the word bacteria in the media, we hear it in terms of disease and health problems. We don't ever hear it in terms of beautiful creatures. And if we ever do see bacteria in our lives, we usually see it in form of rot or how a beautiful breakfast morning can be ruined by some moldy bread. And uh, I'd like to change that conversation. I'd like to think of the bacteria that is around us in more beautiful ways. A friend of mine studying the microbiome told me that the weight of the bacteria that are on us is equivalent to the weight of our leg from knee down. So that's how much bacteria is on us all the time. And we need them to live. They're very important for our lives. And what if we could see them all the time? For example, a beautiful, passionate kiss. What if we could see the bacteria involved in that? <laughs> and so Maria did that. <laughs> and uh, some of you might find this quite ugly. But for me and Maria, we find this quite beautiful. And uh, we want to talk about this. And some people already are. For example, the Micropia, the only museum in the world dedicated to bacteria in Amsterdam, is currently have an exhibit on the science of a kiss. And I think 15 million bacteria are exchanged in one kiss. <laughs> and uh, there's this apparent discourse between art and science, which I totally personally don't believe in. I think they're the same processes. And just due to pragmatic reasons, they've been separated. And once you get into that gap between science and art, wonderful things could happen. And this is not an uncommon conversation. For example, I was just reading an article a few weeks ago in The Cell where this gentleman, Joseph, kind of, I don't agree with him, says that artists create puzzles and scientists solve them. I mean, there's some sense to that. And he gave the example of this Spanish painting that was drawn 400 years ago. You can't quite clearly see it. But here, the artist is standing looking at us. And is the artist drawing us on a paint? Or is the artist drawing the two king and queen, which is reflected on the mirror? Or is the artist drawing the princess? And so it's a puzzle. And people have been debating this. And, and I think this kind of a puzzle and debate happens in science all the time. So here we have a paper from Howard Berg, where he took the strain of salmonella, put the strain back there, right in the middle here, on a minimal plate. And these bacteria on their own, without any manipulation, make these amazing patterns. So science also does create puzzles. And solving them is great fun. And my journey began in Soma seven years ago. It's a restaurant up in Beverly, where I was having dinner with my friends. And I noticed artistic themed etchings on the wall. And I asked who was doing it. And they said, oh, it's someone who works here. And I said, can I meet her? And then they said, oh, she doesn't want to meet you. But I insisted. They're like, I want to meet this person. Because I had ulterior motives. And she finally came. We briefly chit-chatted. And I invited her to come to New England Biolabs, the biotech company where I work. It's surrounded by art. It's a very art, artistic environment. And art and science mixes there all the time. And I, I asked her to come to my lab, showed her bacteria. And she immediately fell in love with them. And our real fun journey has begun then. And <laughs> I am here, the artist, and she is the scientist. <laughs> And uh, there's my <laughs> palette of bacteria. And there she's doing experiments. And we're having fun. So here's our palette. This is our color thing. If we could have the colors lower, and maybe we could see better, but it doesn't matter. So our palette is made out of various colorful bacteria. Some are contaminations. The bane of scientists is actually our pleasure. Uh, things that grow on your plate that shouldn't, but look beautiful, we keep, we store, and we use. 
Some are from the production strains of NEB where we grow them in fermenters to make enzymes, but they happen to naturally have colors of their own. And some are recombinant E. coli strains that are genetically engineered to make colorful uh, pigments. And Maria, in the last seven years, has been getting really good at this. In the beginning, you know, we were drawing like crayons, and now her work is getting much better. So some fantastic work here. And uh, what we really want to do is to kind of convey the beauty of bacteria to the public by using the universal language of art. When you show these pictures to anyone, they'll go, oh, that's really pretty. And then when you tell them that they're bacteria, then there's a pause because they have to now think, oh, that thing that I am disgusted about is beautiful. I mention our work to many people, to laymen in the streets, and a lot of the response I still get today is, that's disgusting, that's gross. But when they see the work, they kind of pause and think about it. And um, we've been uh, very lucky enough to be able to do this for the past seven years. And our work has evolved from simple petri dishes of these beautiful structures to really fancy stuff that we're doing now. And uh, what we are working on are now masks that I've brought some examples of. So after the uh, talk is over today, please approach us. We'll show it to you. And we were doing this all as a hobby until 2015. Maybe one day we'll have a gallery exhibit was our big aim. And then the world's first auger art competition came by. We submitted it, and we won the first prize. And uh, we also won the people's choice with this. And we're very excited. And a few months later, coincidentally, there was a facet bio art competition. We submitted that work. And what we submitted th this time was this chamber here. Uh, it's a chamber that we made in our lab. It has uh, very special designs. And this is what I love about it is that while we're doing this, our master's students, PhD students, and postdocs, they get involved. They give us ideas. And this chamber that we built was over seven years of scientific and artistic collaboration. And you could see the real picture here. And using this chamber, we can make time-lapse movies of bacteria. And this we call the blooming tree of bacillus. And then here's another one where it's just some random serratia interacting with bacillus, making really fun, interesting shapes. And what I'm really proud of is that I wanted to be able to do science and art together. And the real proof that you're doing this together is if you publish an artistic creation such as this in a scientific journal. And so we have just submitted our paper on how to make time-lapse movies to Journal of Bacteriology, and we got very positive reviews. And I hope it'll get accepted soon. And it'll be the first time, I've, at least I have published a pure artistic work in a scientific journal. And now we've moved on to these multiplexed plates and uh, when I saw Maria doing this mask, it inspired me to think that, you know, talk about making the bacteria visible. Well, what if we could have the bacteria on our face visible? So we're now making masks. And here, you can see a time lapse of the face changing. And this is what our face actually would look like if the bacteria could grow on our face more than they do today. And uh, we are definitely not the first ones to do this, and I hope we won't be the last. If you go back as far as uh, Alexander Fleming, these are some uh, arts he did, and the uh, queen was not very amused, apparently. And um, I kind of want to finish off there saying that, you know, we're doing this work very passionately. We want to do more. Our ultimate aim, next aim, is we want to do an exhibit at the Peabody, uh, Peabody Essex Museum. We want to bring all the world's bacterial artists together and there's many of them, and do a final exhibit. I think that's just an introduction, just the beginning of our journey. I hope to work with Maria for many years to come. I thank you for listening to us, and uh, I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. It's absolutely wonderful to be here, and I'm honored to be with you guys. I am embarrassed to tell you I didn't really look carefully before I came, and now I'm blown away. Beautiful, beautiful work. This is going to be a little different. I'm warning you. <laughs>
That was part of an installation that I was very privileged in being part of at, um, at the Arts Summit in the Kennedy Center that Yo-Yo Ma put together. But what was very exciting for me was the music. I never dreamed of putting music together with pictures, and I think it really, I, I liked it. That's why I decided to show it to you. So if, if any of you are curious about anything that you've seen, I actually would like you to yell out a number, and I'll tell you what you what it was. Twelve. All right, that is a uh, a sea animal. It's a Euplectella, and I actually it's about eight inches long, and I made the picture on a flatbed scanner, which has changed my life, <laughs> and it, it's quite remarkable. It, if I were to zoom in, you could see fibers that are 50 microns. It's quite remarkable what you could do with a scanner when it's set at the pro proper DPI. So that's what that is. Ten. ten, yeah. Ten is, you know, ten is a simple drop of water. But, and it was for a book that I did with George Whitesides called No Small Matter, because a simple drop of water is very much about nanoscience. Why exactly is it forming, for example? So that's what that, I'm not getting into it too deeply, but. And nine, let's do, nine is a microscopic image of a micro rotor that uh, MIT uh, scientists actually etched out on a surface. And those are in fact the, the colors when you, when you use a certain technique in microscopy, it emphasizes surface structure. So you're looking at a micro rotor under a microscope. Somebody said what else? There was an, Five, oh, that's two kinds of uh, yeast colonies are actually growing in one Petri dish. And I, when I give a talk, there are different uh, genetic components. They're, they're made, they're, the information is different. That's why you're seeing two different shapes. And uh, it was exciting to grow them in the same Petri dish, a very unusual thing to do. Four is, four is not, not, four is not exactly completely my picture. Um, what four is uh, a manipulated picture taken by the scientist so that it could, because it was so low resolution that I actually played on the pixelation. And the, the final image was about, um, about four feet by four feet and we, we hung a series of those. So that was my manipulation of an already exi existing photograph that was made by the researcher. Oh, two. two, I heard it too, all right. Two is, if you can imagine two circles that are a centimeter uh, across and w the sandwich between those two circles is material that changes, and in fact, two becomes three over time. And so it's a whole, it's a whole study of something called block copolymers. And it's how, and I have a whole series of, of how, that, how you could see those changes taking place. Here's a, here's a f few more that we already also saw. Who else, who wants to know what 11 is? Guess what 11 is? Guess. Say it again, sweetie. Earth. Earth? Fingernail. <laughs> <laughs> metal. metal. Who said metal? Good. It's, it's actually a copper pot bottom that's been oxidized. Number 16 is a microscopic image of Eleanor Rigby, the, the track on a record. <laughs> And so we, that was in our book on the surface of things. Surfaces, there's a lot of stuff, interesting stuff going on. Nine. Nine, uh, nine was taken on my phone. And my life, again, has changed. I'm writing a book called Picturing Science and Engineering. And I actually have a chapter on the fact that you, take, you can take amazing pictures with your phone. That was. Me in the kitchen, I was sauteing peppers 
and I put a glass cover over it, and this is what I saw. It's, it's, uh, it's very much about science. Everything is. I, 12, one more. That, was, that is an inside of a music box, and I'm using it as a, you know, you turn it, and it's, it's binary. It's either on or off, and it's a metaphor for the language that, that which computers use. We're trying to find metaphors to explain complicated ideas. So that music box is either, the, the tone is either on or it's off. And I'm going to end, ten, one more? Yeah, 10 are Proteus colonies, talking about bacteria. Those cells are telling each other where to grow. And it's quite remarkable, and it, researchers are studying exactly why they are go growing in this glorious pattern. Um, I'm going to end. The, my friend sent me this this morning. It reads, I said, I wonder what it means, not tell me what it means. <laughs> you know what? I would like you, after seeing some of my pictures, to say to me, Tell me what it means, because that's my whole thing. I want you to know that this is about everyday phenomena and very much about science, which is all around us. Thanks. Thank you very much for really interesting visual presentations. Um, I'm going to act as a kind of moderator, just catalyst for these folks to keep going with um, their really interesting ideas um, about the images that we saw. So I'll start with um, just two ideas. Um, and it, it actually was iterated for me a lot um, in seeing things that were so, that we otherwise can't see, both all, both, all of you are interested in that to kind of make manifest what we can't see. So um, both scientists and artists seek what is unknown as well, what is not yet clear. And the process of inquiry and in making manifest these ideas is exciting and can motivate you for a lifetime, which I know, Felice, that is true. Um, and then for all of you, it seems the idea of passion, we were chatting about this before, and being passionate drives you to keep looking keep trying to find something that you can't see. So I just think that's a good place to start. And maybe, Felice, do you want to? Is there a question? Is there a question? Um, <laughs> you can continue those ideas. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's my thinking about what you are doing, so. Well, maybe it's because I'm so engrossed right now in this book, but the, the most difficult part of what I do is try to represent things that we can't see and can't even represent. Mm. Yeah, but remember, what I, what the, the pictures that you are seeing of mine are representations. They are not the thing. They are representations. So I have to somehow think about how am I going to communicate this. I mean, even making a decision about what to make a picture of is a decision. So the, ultimately, there's all sorts of manipulations going on philosophically when you make pictures of science. But the, the, most, the most difficult, I'm getting off the track and I apologize, but because that's where my head is at these days, the most difficult thing is to figure out how to represent an idea or a concept in science that is unrepresentable. Yeah. So that's why this notion of metaphor, that's why I, I'm very much involved with thinking about making pictures that sort of relate to the scientific phenomena. But nothing is ever completely represented. Mm -hmm. There's always something that's not. Well, Any uh, thoughts? <laughs> yeah, going back to a question about passion, me and Maria, we talked about this intensively for five, 10 minutes before this. And we, we really <clears throat> couldn't come up with an answer. I think it's a profound question that we should all be asking ourselves every day. <laughs> Why do you do what you do? Why do you get out of bed? And uh, I don't know. We, we talked and we talked. We couldn't come up with a clear answer except fun. And there's no other way to do it. Like, if Maria disappeared and the Bacteria Art Project finished, 
I'd be looking for something else. It, it just has to be done. The passion, I think, is just like an itch. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, well, for me now, since I'm working with uh, Memo and I discover bacteria and all this uh, scientific pr uh, process, is to keep going and doing, is, everything is new. So right. it's, it's amazing to be doing new things almost every day right. when I, I mean, go to the lab. You know, so. it, it seems that Mehmet, uh, gave you a new vocabulary, new materials, and then also the vocabulary that you yes. are discovering, like how do you, mm -hmm. how do you make something yeah. interesting and, yeah. New media, um, new everything. I'm, I'm working with, with um, live organisms, right, so. Right. I, I just want to say something, this is kind of parenthetical, but um, one of my early uh, catalysts, early conversations was with Felice Frankel and Alan Lightman, and probably most of you know that he's a MIT physicist and a novelist. And he said something to the effect that both, for both artists and scientists, the metaphor is imperative. And that for the, for, for the scientists, eventually the metaphor has to be kind of be left behind and you need to be able to, you know, empirically repeat the, um, the action. And for art, but art stays in the metaphor. And that's just something that has, Stayed with me for stayed with me for a long time, and it seems apropos of kind of what you just said. Except you, you, it's kind of a little different because the metaphor is letting you or helping the viewer understand the science, right? So it's kind of the metaphor is a vehicle. Vehicle. It's yeah. not the end of. I mean, people will say to me, "Why don't you call yourself an artist?" Um, I don't. I hope you don't consider that I'm being braggadocio here, but I, it, it's really an issue of intention, because I, I don't, I don't care about your looking at me. I want you to look at the science, and and so the metaphor that we try to come up with, ultimately, by the way, always falls apart, mm -hmm. which in fact is a very interesting conversation to have. Where does the metaphor fall apart? Because when you talk about that, then you have to dig deeper into the science. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a trivial pursuit, even though it's a game. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I find that fascinating, and I've heard you talk about that before. Because what you make is so, you know, so, you know, gorgeous, so beautiful, and so there's that high level of aesthetics and. All the th all the decisions one makes to be able to create work that way, but you are kind of humble and you say no, it's not. I mean, to, I'm just yeah. yeah I, I I just just I'm not gonna. I'll stop now. But I, I, <laughs> I, I I'm revealing what's already there. I'm really I'm, there's very very few of those images. I'm trying to think are manipulated. It's straight photography. Um, that is, it, it, the composition is a manipulation, and the decision of when, you know, you, those, those circles that somebody asked me about, you saw it at two minutes, and then you saw it 24 hours later, and it's a whole different thing. But ultimately, it's about the science that I want you to pay attention to. May I ask you guys? Sure. Do, Maria, are Please. you learning about science when you make your art? Yes. And I want to learn more. Like I asked Memo the other day, I want to know about microbiology, and I'm super interested now in 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 learning. Yeah, I am. I mean, he's teaching me. You know, I inocul inoculate my own bacteria. I do the agar. I pour the petri dishes. All this. I I would I would have never think that I will be doing something like that ever. <laughs> right, so one of the first images Mehmet showed was the the kiss. Yes. Was that you kissing the, yeah. the I dish? Kiss the plate. Yeah, I kiss I put my ear to, I take some of the bacteria and then paint with it. It's like, <laughs> it's yeah. crazy for me. And yeah. So here's a good example of how Maria's art actually is overlapping with science. She put her hair in there, and she did this many times. And we observed that the, when she puts her hair, only one type of bacteria comes out. And then we start asking, well, is this unique to her? And we ask someone else's hair. And a total different type of bacteria came out, but only one type. And then I said, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Let's look into the microbiome of hair. 
Broad has already done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting way, it seems, that you know, this sort of artistic pursuit then informed the science. You know, mm -hmm. And is that what led you to create the um, uh, time-lapse um, imagery for, uh, to see how the bacteria it's an old hobby. Any friend of mine knows that I, wherever I go on holiday, whatever I do, I always do time lapses of everything. And since I'm a microbiologist, I'm like, oh, I got to do time lapses of mm -hmm. this too. And it, it really was for no good reason then fun. Mm -hmm. And in one publication of us, we have a figure based on that use. So uh, I think personally for us, it's just fun and, and we really enjoy what we do. It just really makes me come to lab more often. And, yeah. and I also love the interaction that she has with it. Well, wouldn't that be the answer to the passion question? Like, it's just what gets, it's, you know, what yeah. you want to do. And I think. And I'll be constantly, constantly learning stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And you're never me. finished. It's never done. It always yeah. needs to be done more or. You know, I'll take this path, and I'm sure, Felice, that's the case for you. That's the dirty little secret that you, I'm constantly learning. Yes. And that's why I think it should be part of the education mm -hmm. for me to get kids to take pictures of what they see in their lives and then ask a scientist, what is this about? It should be part of it, mm -hmm. right? But it, I tried, forget <laughs> it. Deborah, you said something a few minutes ago that got me stuck. You said, you know, it begins with a metaphor and then you repeat it, you reproduce it until you control it scientifically. And there we have a dirty little secret too, and it's called mm. error bars. <laughs> Actually, we are also not fully in control of our arts and science. We try to reproduce it and get the same result, but we never do. And then we just give it an error bar saying that it kind of works like that I sometimes. See. But sometimes there are things that are are successfully reproducible, no? Within I error see. bars. I see, all <laughs> the okay, so, so you can make the Mona Lisa every time, right, but then it's we're not all, the same. We're all living in this yeah. metaphor, right? Yeah. So, and I mean, I sometimes, I think about this a lot, that idea, um, first introduced to me by Alan Lightman, that perhaps we, we need the metaphor, or it's, an, it's because things are so complicated and because our language is limited as our brains are limited. So the metaphor is just a way to kind of sort of understand something. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I think that for, for, for all of you, that this idea of being able to visualize something or to help the, the viewer visualize what you're seeing or thinking about, I mean, that's to me the, the sort of power of, of the image, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. We will. Um, maybe a few more from me, and then um, I'm very happi to open it up. And you guys will M microphones. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, um, maybe I'll just jump to you again, uh, which is um, you did a wrote a book called Picturing to Learn, uh, uh, where you observed that undergraduate students clarified their own understanding of scientific concepts by drawing, by creating drawings that explain these concepts to non-experts and I love that you did that as a photographer. And I also love the, the connection between drawing, observing, and science. You know, um, that's an homage to Leonardo, right, who you had a quote of. And so I just would like you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it, um, it, it was that. First of all, I can't draw. So that, that's one of the reasons why I make pictures, because that I know how to do. The, the, it turns out the, it wasn't a book, it was a, a program, an NSF-funded okay. program, where we had five universities, uh, undergrads, they would, we asked them to draw as if they were explaining to a high school student the various phenomena that they're learning in, in class. And the best part was that we saw their mistakes and their omissions. You could, they could answer the question right, you know, or the problem set they got. But, when, but, but in terms of deep understanding of various phenomena, these are very bright kids who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And so even the faculty, in fact, we have, I have 2,000 drawings. I am sponsoring, I am supporting, you could go to Picturing to Learn to see 2,000 drawings if you like. And some of them are amazing but they missed, and the 
faculty literally had changed the way they teach certain phenomena because they saw that the, the kids weren't getting it. I mean, unfortunately, we had it for five years. It ran beautifully. And then, of course, NSF said, thank you very much. That's the end of that. But it, it was this whole notion of drawing in order to communicate to somebody else is a means of not only engaging them in the science, but also finding out what their misconceptions were. It was really great. Mm. So maybe just one more um, <clears throat> thought, question, and then we can open to, to the audience, which is um, you know, this idea of using imagery as a means of inquiry. Um, so maybe you can both talk about that, and that would be, I think, a good segue to the audience. So that the you know, making the image, seeking the images is, is your own questioning, so. I think for us, it goes back to uh, the talk that I gave, which is that, you know, vis uh, art is a universal language. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to understand it. You could go anywhere around the globe. I think those images will be pretty and beautiful to most people on the planet. And so that opens the language. That opens the next step so much better. I can just show this picture to anyone in the world and then say, this is bacteria. And then you know, you're know you so much deep into the conversation right there. If you start the conversation without the image, just talk about bacteria, then I don't think you can get that. You know, People don't open up as much. Mm. I think that's my personal experience when I talk mm. about my work. <clears throat> I first show the image, and then I tell them it's bacteria. Mm -hmm. If I do the reverse, I get a completely different right. response. Mm. And and the images are always very sort of pleasing and beautiful. I'm, I'm just wondering if you've ever made one where it was not well designed, you know, kind of an anti-image or something. I think the artist should take this question. <laughs> well, this is or, just what inspired me. I think like, so we, we, nature, that's where it ends up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's just. What, what was really beautiful one day was uh, she was, Maria was looking at bacteria. She goes, oh my god. And she showed me a picture of bacteria that were exactly like her etching artworks yes. that she was doing before was she doing joined etchings. the lab. Yeah, <laughs> that they were the same shapes. I was like, this looks like my yeah, art. Something, something found you, right? Yeah, yeah, because it's in everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in your body, in your veins. All those shapes are kind of, no? <laughs> in nature, in bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have? A well, just just the, the the fact that people are not intimidated when you when they see a picture, and they're not embarrassed to ask questions. It's a means of engaging them to ask questions. Mm -hmm. That's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think that's a good moment, um, or and you know, segue to the audience. And I just wanted to ask. Um, uh, Mehmet, right, and Maria, in a way, the impression was that you got so seduced by the image that I kept waiting for a little bit of science. Mm -hmm. I kept wanting to know what are those bacteria doing? What's the life like? And sometimes the words are important there, and I didn't quite get that. Because, you know, you want to know, well, oh my God, I haven't seen bacteria do that. What are they doing? So that's a kind of a scientific question, so yeah. I'll take this one. <laughs> so we see the bacteria do that every day in normal science. Every, yeah, we, the science, microbiologists in the lab, we see these beautiful shapes every day. So we're, I don't know a single microbiologist who doesn't think bacteria are beautiful. We all do. And so that's the beginning of the process. You're like, there's this beautiful shape here, and how could I you know, make something of it? And always at the back of your mind, you're thinking, <clears throat> why? What are they doing? Why is that color there? And why is that shape there? And personally, my lab doesn't study it, but we just have initiated a project like that. So the, if you remember my talk, remember the bacteria that made that pattern? Uh, I, I contacted the scientist, Howard Berg, and I got that bacteria. And Maria's in the middle of making those media. She's going to replicate those shapes. And once we can replicate it, we're going to ask questions. What exactly controls those shapes, temperature, media, amount of succinate, amount of amino acids. And we're going to begin kind of blindly, like just what happens if we change parameters? What's, we don't really have a hypothesis or an experiment. So we're not asking a biological question. But it, it kind of begins like that with, 
a drawing on a whiteboard and an idea, you have no idea where it's going, and then you just follow the data. So we personally don't study the shapes and the colors, but those questions are constant in our brain. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for arranging this event. Uh, my name is Dawood. I'm a uh, visiting researcher in MIT in physics. I'm coming from Netherlands. I have a little a story uh, related to Felice, and then I want to ask her a question. Uh, Felice, uh, you did an amazing job with initiating uh, this TEDx course, uh, Making Science and Engineering Pictures. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so I was really uh, happy that uh, uh, I could participate in the course. I learned a lot, and it's just something that meets my, ma my passion. I mean, I really want to bring artistic presentation, presentation into science. And uh, I hope that we, I can learn a lot in this course. And basically, I did what I couldn't uh, foresee was that I could use this and got the cover journal of soft matter just two months after that. It was pretty amazing for me. <coughs> yeah, so my question to you is that, uh, uh, why basically this uh, kind of artistic presentation of science is not appreciated to the, to the level that it deserves really in the scientific community? And even more than that, you see some resistive forces against this. It's a great question. And I, I have to tell you, things are changing. I've been doing this for 24 years now. And it was hard at the beginning when I first came on campus. It's a long story how I got there. But uh, your generation knows that this is important. It's a means of expressing research to the public. And frankly, we have to engage the public, not only for research understanding, but for the public to make better decisions than they've been making. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so I think that I'm, I'm not, there's no brick wall any longer. There was at the beginning when I came on campus, especially the theoretical physicists, by the way. They said, what, what, what does she want? But it's, it's much easier now, and it is respected. So finally, there should be pe more people like me. I'm, I'm not doing anything unusual. I'm really not being coy here. I'm doing something that a lot of other people can be doing, and I think it should be part of a curriculum. It's another thing I've tried to make happen. Not yet. But Hi. it's it's happening. It's respected. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Judy. I'm a creative arts teacher. I used to teach in Boston and now in Israel. So I appreciate the integration. and. Um, our background is from MIT. But what I want to ask you, I'm, I'm also a musician, is the Yo-Yo Ma um, project? Can you just tell this a was, more? This was, I'll, I'll try to make it fast. This is one of these insane things that happened. 20 years ago, Yo-Yo Ma was given one of my books by someone. And that was it. 20 years later, I get an email from his people saying, we have this art summit. We're putting together a, a rotating slideshow. We showed him what we have. He said, no, this is not what I want. This is what I want. 20 years later, he remembered the book. They then, that, that, that was an excerpt from, and there were two other photographers as well. It was an art summit at the Kennedy Center where they discuss art. You, you could look it up, Kennedy Center Art Summit. The, I mean, it was one of these insane moments that I said, my goodness, things happen, don't they? And then I had the joy of meeting this guy. He's ridiculously wonderful mm -hmm. and generous and very much involved with the arts. Mm -hmm. He actually has a program running he, wants, he thinks that one of the reasons why, we're, why we've wound up where we are is because there's not enough art in our, in our lives. But mass cultural arts really is supporting this kind of integration just in the schools. Also, what um, medium do you use in your art when you paint? 
what, what, yeah, Maria. Uh, can you repeat? When please? you paint, what do you use? Is it acrylics? I, I, I never paint. That's the funny thing. <laughs> I used to do, well, I do a sculpture and engraving. So I just start painting with bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm curious whether you, you or maybe you know of other people who actually tell a story rather than a snapshot in time, but actually use this kind of scientific art to have people take an action, whether it, it could be wash your hands or save the planet or some other kind of action that you're using by telling a story through these pictures? That's a good idea. If you, uh, we should talk. I'll catch you after. Yeah. Um, I'm working with a nonprofit called EcoArt. And what they do is they have contests like what you have participated in, where they use art and science to tell a story and hopefully get people to appreciate the world around them, and so then maybe they'll protect it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't give the message of washing your hands. <laughs> You're destroying art. Um, I, I have a question specifically about the mask that you made. Uh, are the bacteria that symmetrical and predictable? Uh, I was thinking of the one that had several panels, mm -hmm. uh, and the colors mm -hmm. were Continuous. This one. This one. The panel with the mask. Oh, this one. No, no, the one that's like a bunch of plates. Oh, this is. With oh, the, yeah, but this with is the mask, not, though. We so, uh, this, is this, um, so Maria has taken seven years to get this far, and uh, it, those things kind of might look beautiful and simple, but I can assure you that it's amazingly difficult. <laughs> not every bacteria grows at the same speed. Not all of them like the same temperature. She applies the slow-growing bacteria first, puts it at 30 degrees, then puts the bacillus at the end, then has Nystarconia, which grows at 4 degrees. So those shapes and colors. They take a long time. And then you know, I, I, I can make six, seven of them, and one is mm. symmetrical. And you know, then the bacteria start growing somewhere else. And you know, so <laughs> yeah. And we but we, I work with that too. I like when there is contamination and I draw around it or, you know, I use it as well. I like it. I think we have time for like three more. Yeah. Um, uh, so my question, I'm, I'm still trying to formulate this, um, so I'm sorry if it's a little incoherent. Um, but I, I think a lot of um, art as a way of connecting. And I think that's the power in art that uh, it sort of democratizes uh, people and democratizes experiences. And sometimes science has the tendency to be more authoritarian um, in terms of knowledge production and in the way that expertise is valued. Um, and I see some of this art, although being beautiful, as having inherent in that, that tension between this sense of wanting to present and democratize knowledge, but also it being very based, based very much on expertise, um, the sense that these photographs or these images um, are telling a, or trying to tell us a specific story uh, about science and about knowledge. And I'm just wondering um, how might art function as a way to open up science to more critique and discourse as opposed to something that is uh, almost seems like a deficit model of understanding what science is and, and how people sh should understand it, if that's coherent. <laughs> wow. I, th I think I, I, I know what you're getting at. I, I, uh, in my opinion, one way of engaging people in a science image, for example, is to engage them in the process of how I made the science image. I think the more people understand when you see a picture, a, a Hubble picture, 
of the Eagle Nebula, for example, these glorious colors are fake. The, that an, an artist, decision, the de various decisions were made according to certain gases present, but the bottom line is people actually think that the universe looks like this. So the more we welcome people into our process in, in terms of making our images, I think the more they'll ask about the science and become maybe even photographers, but all, at the very least to become critical thinkers. That's what we're really getting at, at least that's what I'm getting at. I want people to make good decisions from, it's not a thought authoritarian, science is science. I mean, phenomena are phenomena. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not fake news. <laughs> Uh, I can add one sentence to that, uh, if I understood you correctly, and if I'm following her up, is that these images are beautiful and they can do so much to a certain level of communication and talking, but the real interaction between art and science is when you actually do it. So when I'm going to go to Ipswich High School with Maria in a month, and we're going to interact with students there, and we're going to talk about the science of bacteria, and then follow it up with making arts with that. Mm -hmm. And when you touch and paint and draw and you feel and you smell, that's when the dialogue begins. That's when you know, a lot of walls fall down and they have the courage to ask and the curiosity gets in there. <clears throat> that's what happened to me. I was I think we have time for one more. Whoever, yeah, great. Uh, uh, I'm fusing two questions into one. One is probably for Maria and one is probably for Mama. Maria, um, when you are collaborating <clears throat> with your bacteria, um, I assume that the processes they undergo are fugitive, and when, you, when they produce the image that you have uh, navigated your way through in directing them, how long does that image last? And the question for Mama is, why do you think the, what do you, what do you think is the reason for this apparent universality of uh, judgment of beauty of these images. Why is that? So they last, it depends on, on the bacteria that I'm using. And usually we, I put, it, put them on the fridge and it could last uh, months. Uh -huh. But we got this um, technique, we embed, embed them in epoxy. So I take the, the agar from the Petri dish and put epoxy. So it, it it lasts with the, with the colors, like the real colors that the bacteria have, probably like six months sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes they fade before. It depends on uh -huh. the bacteria. Um, a plug-in to answer that. You, I've heard a lot of technical questions about how we work, how does it work, and all that. If you go to our webpage, bacterialart.com, okay. there are videos that show you how we make it and how it lasts. There are a lot of articles there. Great. So that give you a lot more information than tonight. Yeah. And again, everyone, please come down and see the epoxy and what she's talking about. And going back to your apparent public, I, I blame the media. It's a very cultural problem, um, especially in America. I lived in many different countries. I've never seen a Western world as scared as Americans. Escalators attack you, bacteria attack you, foreigners attack you, everyone, oh my God. There's a scare bacteria, the, the scare for bacteria in this society is amazing, you know? And uh, study after study shows that you have to be in dirt, you have to, the bacteria are good for you. We all as childhood grew up in mud and dirt, and now we're in the sterile world of sanitation, and like the lady said, wash your hands. And one of the experiments I do with the kids is, you take your hand, you touch agar, and whatever's on your hand, grows, then you wash your hands, you touch it, and the number of bacteria don't decrease. So we have this very disconnect from reality. And probably media has a big role because they're supposed to educate us and not make us fear them. And the scientists, I think, has to get off their ivory tower and engage with the public. My question was actually the oh. opposite, Oops. which is why everybody you show these images to agrees that they're beautiful. Until what is hear. going on there? Why do you think there's that, that universality of judgment? That I've been asking since I was thinking, what is beautiful? Why do we find a sunset beautiful? Well, one hypothesis, and I wonder what you think of this, is that it's because they're us. Yeah. Everything, <laughs> yeah. everything is us. 
We it, like it's sort of like uh, the question about math and beauty. Yeah. That's a book. Some books have been written on it. My basic boring answer is that art helps us survive. So we live in a very messy, chaotic world. And we want that succulent fruit. We want that warm bed. We want that clean water. So art represents those images that helps us survive. And ugly things are rotting, disease, and nasty, and dirt. So this goes evolutionary to art helping us survive. And that kind of morphed into this thick cortex brain of ours. And we've now, that's a hand-waving <laughs> answer. <laughs> I think that's a great place to uh, end this <laughs> evening. And thank you very much, Mehmet, thank you. Maria, and Felice. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I just want to make a few announcements that um, our next program is November 16th at MIT at the Bartos. And um, at the moment, the title is Bits, Sights, and Sounds with Mary Sherman, Florian Grand, and Hiroshi Ishii. Um, I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, and also to tell you, we've decided and we have begun uh, the launch of a podcast. And our first one, uh, we did it a couple weeks ago with Alan Lightman. And so um, it's called Listening to Catalyst, and it's kind of been an extension of these conversations with all kinds of iterations. And um, so um, I invite you to join us in the lobby, and we can see what Pear has come up with uh, with the tweets. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>